That's fine. No, it's fine. I just want to know so that I don't tell that story that you wanted me to tell. <laughs> Not now. Tell you later. Um, okay, so um, my name is Katie Masaurus. Uh I suppose I should stay microphoned. My name is Katie Masaurus, and I am the chief policy officer for a company called Hacker One. I joined Hacker One about nine weeks ago. And before that, I spent seven years as a security strategist at Microsoft. Um, I ran Microsoft's security community outreach programs and last year launched Microsoft's first ever bug bounty programs. Um, rewinding the clock even further, I was a penetration tester for about seven years. Um, and before that, I was a Linux developer. So long story short, my career in vulnerability discovery, disclosure coordination, I have seen the bugs for both sides, all sides now. Um, and I've done response. Somebody, somebody knows what song I'm talking about. Okay, I did a lot of karaoke last night, so I still got the music in me. Um, that's not happening on the recording, by the way. Not now. Um, so, what I'd like to talk about, and we've got 30 minutes. Um, I'd like to actually find out a little bit about what the audience in this room is most interested in hearing. Um, I can talk to you from, you know. Ex you know, experiences doing security response and vulnerability coordination from an open source standpoint, obviously to a closed source standpoint, um, and then, you know, more about some of the common problems that you will encounter when you're trying to coordinate vulnerabilities with organizations. I can also tell you about some ISO standards that I have worked on that have been published this year. Um, there's an ISO standard on vulnerability disclosure, 29147, that was published in February, February of this year. It took only a short breadth of nine years um, to do, uh, six, six or seven of which I was working on them. Uh, um, and there's another ISO standard on vulnerability handling coordination, 30111. But some of you already look sleepy. So maybe I won't start with ISO standards. Um, I know a lot of the people in this room, but for the people who I don't interact with on a regular basis, tell me a little bit about yourselves. Are you security researchers? Anybody in the room find vulnerabilities? Okay. Um, all right, yeah, I know you. Okay, fine, you're allowed to, you're also allowed to participate. Um, but um, how many of you work for uh, companies that, that have software of some kind, any kind? Any kind of website? Wow, some people don't work at all, okay. I'm pretty sure everybody at least has a web presence these days if it's a company. Um, but essentially, vulnerability response and coordination is something that every organization with any kind of online presence, any kind of website, even if software, making software is not your business, there will be opportunities for the research community to identify where your humanity has crept into your coding experience and you have made a mistake. So, um, <laughs> So, uh, so one of the things I like to talk about when I talk about vulnerability coordination and disclosure is the need for empathy. Um, in a way, when I worked at Microsoft, I was, I was effectively a bi-directional cultural liaison. You know, the hacker community might have an issue that they dis disagreed with Microsoft on. Microsoft might have some issues, you know, in terms of the complexity of the software, interoperability, testing, application compatibility that might make a fix take longer than a researcher thought it should. And part of my job was to kind of negotiate and build empathy on both sides. So one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind when uh, you're coordinating vulnerabilities is understanding where the other party is coming from. Um, do you guys have any specific areas that you want to focus on before you leave, sir? <laughs> Bounties, you say? I started Microsoft's first ever bounty program, so if that's where you want to go with this, we can talk about that. Well, then sit yourself back down. Get on back down there. Yeah, Alan. Tr and now, all right, bad touch. Fine, Alan, you know what? You can leave if you really want to, but I can talk about economic incentives, um, which, AKA bounty programs. So how many of you are familiar with the bounty programs I started last year? Okay. Everyone, even you, and you were still going to walk out on me, buddy. Now I'm bullying. Yeah, no. <laughs> All right, so, so um, those, those programs were unique in that they were created, it took about three years to create these programs that were suitable for, you know, for my former employees, uh, em, former employers' needs, um, and aligning the research community 
with what they needed in terms of, uh, of getting the vulnerabilities earlier after release and essentially using a, a facet of a gap in the marketplace to provide an incentive where no other players were buying. And that specifically I'm talking about uh, um, the IE11 um, beta bounty program. So that was during the first 30 days of the IE11 beta period. It was kicked off last summer. And essentially what, what, the, what the gap in the market was is nobody was really buying browser bugs in beta. Um, the reason for that is that customers haven't deployed it, so it's not a great target for the black market actors. The white market folks who would be using it for defense pur purposes, again, not really useful to like, let's say a ZDI who makes an IDS product because no customers are deploying it. So there's this gap in the market that we were able to provide an incentive. We were the only game in town, and we predictably actually moved the spike of vulnerabilities that we would normally only get after code was complete and released to manufacturing. Very awkward time to get all of these critical bugs. Um, we moved that to the beginning of the beta period. So that was an example of having empathy with what the business actually needed. So if you're in a position right now where you're trying to convince your organization that a bug bounty is a great idea, there are a few different angles you can take to, to use that. Is anybody interested in hearing about that? Or really, I was supposed to be talking about disclosure, but we can talk about economic incentives and everything. Just change the title on the recording, it's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so the question, as I understand it, and let me know if I'm wrong, is how do you prioritize uh, the different classes of vulnerabilities in terms of their importance? Um, is it in the context of, uh, in terms of their importance for addressing them, or in terms of their importance for providing incentives? Okay, well, so how do, how do organizations generally prioritize bugs? Um, so every organization is going to experience a different volume. For organizations who experience a very low volume of incoming bugs, it makes sense and is practical to just fix all the bugs. As they come in, just fix them all. For organizations that start receiving huge, massive, internet scale numbers of volumes of bugs, um, my previous employer was getting over 200,000 non-spam email message, messages a year into secure at Microsoft.com, funneling down, doing the triage, and distilling it down to maybe about 100 CVEs fixed per year. So it's a lot of work on the front end and the funnel. And those were all legit bugs at the tail end of it. So the 100 CVEs, obviously all legit bugs. The way that a lot of organizations do it is first they establish what, what could be called a bug bar. And that's essentially a ranking for severity of what's the worst that could happen if this bug is exploited. So Microsoft used critical, important, moderate, low, or AKA defense in depth. And they actually have it published. Their bug bar, if you go to Microsoft.com slash SDL, you can look for a sample bug bar and it gives you the exact criteria. They actually split the bug bar between uh, what would count as a critical on, um, on the server versus a critical on the client and there are differences there, subtle differences. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it uh, would be CVSS, right? Score the bug. Um, a lot of organizations use that. There are other factors, and these are actually touched on in the ISO standards. Other factors to consider in terms of bug prioritization are the likelihood or ease of exploit. You've got a bug that may be critical if an attacker is able to exploit it. Critical consequences, right? You know, full remote code execution, but very difficult to exploit. Whereas you might have one that's categorized as important according to your bug bar, but perhaps important is, for example, a sandbox escape. The sandbox escape, you know, uh, basically leaking information that can allow you to bypass ASLR or DEP or one of the platform level mitigations, you're going to end up with something that in and of itself, by itself, does not lead directly to remote code execution, 
but in combination with another vulnerability that may have been harder to exploit without it, enables the exploitation of that vulnerability. So in a very simple scenario, you know, the bugs come in, you do a very quick, you know, prioritization against your bug bar, and then you kind of fix as you go. As you get more and more sophisticated in your security response, you're going to take some other factors into consideration. Another factor that does have to do with the topic at hand is intended disclosure. So sometimes finders will come to you and they have very hard deadlines in their own disclosure policies. Maybe they've only worked with open source software that's not really widely deployed. A whole lot of testing doesn't have to go into it. When I was a Linux developer, the way that I would text test fixes is, does this compile? Yeah. Hey, buddy, does it compile for you? All right, good to go. Let's go. Hit it, you know. Put it on the FTP server and then send a note to bug track so, and saying that we fixed it. That was where we were crowdsourcing our unit testing. Right? <laughs> so that's a very different model than, you know, than, than uh, enterprise software, right? It's also going to be a very different model in terms of prioritization um, around somebody's disclosure timeline if it's something that you are fixing on your own online services, so systems that you run and control, control the configurations, versus if you are a maker of what I would call box products, um, which is something that will run on client systems. So, you know, anything that, that a user would have to take some action to install a patch or an update or make a configuration change in order to remediate the vulnerability. Those are going to require a lot more testing um, and a lot more time because essentially you're going to end up with uh, a lot more variants of configurations as opposed to running your own web services. This is a very long-winded answer to your question. Did I get most of it? Okay, close enough. All right, right on. I'll take it. How much time do we have? And oh, we have time. Other questions? <laughs> yes. Okay, so the question, as I understood it, is a uh, role in the ecosystem of third-party players such as ZDI, like a vulnerability broker, interacting with vendors. Vendors may supply their own bug bounties. Um, those third-party bounties exist. Is that the gist of your question? And, and do I see that as evolving? What? Yes. Yes, I do. Did I plant this guy? Actually, he tried to leave, so no. Um, Absolutely, I do. Um, I was ecstatic, actually, when I saw um, when I saw the evolution of some of these uh, market enabler type companies, um, and my company, HackerOne, is no exception to this. Um, what we're seeing is uh, is the fact that there's a recognition that there is an active and healthy vulnerability economy. There are many players in it, you know, in terms of the finders of vulnerabilities um, who may, you know, some people will always want to stay white market no matter what, no matter how much money is dangled in front of them. Some people will, will maybe venture into the gray land, maybe not care as much how their vulnerability information is used once they sell it. And then there's some that are just in it for top dollar. They will find whoever the black market broker is who will help them achieve that top dollar. And Black market, you know, I, I'm talking about white, gray, and black markets, even, even though all of these markets are actually legal markets. When I think about white, gray, and black markets in this vulnerability economy and exploit marketplace, it's intended use. So for me, white market is intended use is defense. You're acquiring these vulnerabilities either as the first party vendor or as a ZDI who gives it to the first party vendor to get it fixed, practices coordinated disclosure, doesn't release technical details until the, the issue is fixed, et cetera. That's white market to me in this economy. Gray market is more mixed use. You know, there can be some exploit sales to folks, and perhaps those exploit sales are used to test defenses, maybe, or maybe they're not, you know. And then there's the pure black market use, which would essentially be buying vulnerabilities, buying exploits that are specifically intended to be used to attack and, uh, and ideally stay stealthy and undetected for as long as possible. So that's what I'm talking about there. Um, when I went to get back to your question about the um, evolution of these third-party players, I think there are a lot of broker models out there. Um, one of the things that that I think is sorely needed, and as somebody who has done phone disclosure um, in one form or another, as I said at the beginning, um, you know, either from the finder side, the coordinator side, the vendor side, 
is the fact that vuln coordination in and of itself is not that straightforward for a lot of people. Even major mega corporations can't even get the basics down some, sometimes. And then you also have new researchers coming into the ecosystem who may not know what to expect. Maybe they had a great disclosure experience that only took, you know, 48 hours for a tiny open source vendor to fix. And then they go and they find something in a giant mega corporation, they're shocked, you know, at the timelines, at the nuances and all that stuff. Um, and I think one of the key things that these, these intermediaries are now, um, now looking at trying to facilitate, my company included, is facilitate that conversation such that it's much more predictable. I would never want to see a security researcher approach uh, an organization with a vulnerability and um, be referred to legal action, you know. Um, I think that that, to me, is, is probably one of the one of the, the best uses of, you know, the, some of those intermediaries and whatnot. Um, it happens with, uh, it happens a lot still. It really depends. If an organization doesn't have a response process, it's, it's quite likely, you know, it depends on who gets wind of what's happening and how powerful they are, they are in the organization, how powerful, you know, a particular voice of reason, maybe, you know, in the organization. Um, but you still see these, these really adverse reactions and, and essentially, uh, I think it's because um, organizations who have never met a security researcher or a hacker before trying to f inform them in a friendly way about security issues, um, they just take on a very defensive posture and it can get hostile and escalate very quickly. And obviously, it can escalate on both sides very quickly, which doesn't help the end user in the end. Um, I think you had a question. Yeah. Uh, that is a great question. How do I see bug bounty programs changing the rule of professional consulting services? So, do you guys remember when it was hard to sell a pen test? It's hard. I mean, how many of you are as old as I am? At least some of you. Um, it used to be hard to sell a penetration test. It's like, what are you going to pay hackers to hack us? Are you crazy? You know, that was, uh, you know, that was uh, heresy. And penetration tests are something that are not only normal, but they're often required by regulation, you know, the regulatory requirements for third party security testing. So that industry, I feel like, is evolving. And when, when I started the bounty programs at Microsoft, the internal code name for those bounty programs was ad hoc pen testing, because it was essentially opening up the pen test world to, you know, the pen test um, to, instead of consulting companies, the entire world. And you would only pay for the bugs that they found. In a penetration test, you know, I was one of the artists formerly known as At Stake, the typical engagement time was two people, two weeks. So even if you had the best At Stakers on a particular gig, you've got two weeks to get comfortable with the environment, read whatever documentation or anything that the client was willing to provide to you, and get as many bugs as possible. And often they wanted you to start at black box, which meant you got zero info. You were coming in as an outside attacker. Now, yes, that's useful in telling them, is there a lot of low-hanging and highly exploitable fruit that a reasonable attacker can find in a couple of weeks? Sure, that's useful. But is it useful in terms of of actually finding as many serious security holes as possible? No, because attackers typically will have, you know, uh, unlimited time and resources is what we would say about it. So what I think um, in terms of bug bounties, it's really opened up the eyes of organizations to understand that even the best penetration testers have time constraints and resource constraints and potentially skill constraints. You might not get the, uh, the exact consultants that would have found that, that show-stopping issue on your site or on your platform or in your software. But somebody random out in the world playing with your site for, you know, indeterminate period of time may very well find it and save you and your customers from certain doom. So, yeah. So generally, I think your question is how, 
how do the constraints in current bug bounty programs compare to constraints for a traditional pen test? Um, usually traditional penetration test tests are done under NDA. I have not met any that are not done under non-disclosure agreement. Um, some bug bounty programs out there require non-disclosure agreements. Um, some don't. Um, Microsoft, for example, did not require any kind of NDA to get paid. I paid $100,000 out twice, no NDA. But what we were asking was that the researcher worked with us and coordinated with us on any disclosure. So, you know, example of that, James Forshaw was the first recipient of $100,000 um, mitigation bypass bounty, which was a bounty for a new technique. Um, he coordinated the disclosure of his blog that explained the technique after some other finders had started publishing some details that were close. No cigar, but close. So it seemed fair that even though the issue hadn't been addressed, because it's a complex architectural issue, even though it hadn't been fixed yet, well, there were some other researchers that were kind of finding the trail of breadcrumbs. Made sense to have our guy who worked with us the whole time to go ahead and, and disclose his, his, you know, research around it. So it depends on the organization. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I, I I lobbied for that very high, uh, you know, very, very strongly in terms of the creation of Microsoft's bounty programs, that intellectual property would remain um, in the hands of the researcher and that there was no NDA. Because I didn't want them to have to make a choice, right, between do the right thing and get paid or keep it for themselves and maybe figure out what they want to do with it later. Didn't want to have, have them make a hard choice there. Now, there are other uh, third-party bounty programs that will make the researchers sign an NDA before joining the platform. Um, HackerOne does not make the researchers sign an NDA before joining the platform. We, again, we don't want to make it a hard choice. A researcher is free to go to an organization outside of our platform, um, like Neil Mehta did for coordination of Heartbleed, right? He was the original finder of Heartbleed. He didn't report it through the HackerOne platform, but through the internet bug bounty, we awarded him $15,000. Because he's a nice guy, he, uh, he sent it off to charity. Sorry, I just have to do this. Ain't no timeline when she's pwned. Okay, sorry, I had to. We were, stop it. You do not get give me a yellow card for that. You don't even get yellow cards. Um, so, so anyway, that gets me a red card now, right? Okay, um, so the lack of timeline. I'm sorry, I just had to. I have the music in me, I can't stop. Um, lack of timeline. That is an organizational maturity issue. Okay, um, when you think about it, what, uh, what do vendors do? They, they make stuff to sell it to people. If they, if they spent their engineering resources on bug fixes and testing and whatnot, that has to come out of somewhere. And usually that comes out of building the next product. So uh, that doesn't mean that they get away with not fixing anything. But it's a matter of educating an organization that may not be prepared to deal with servicing their vulnerabilities in an appropriate time frame. Um, I was talking about this a little bit yesterday. These, these devices right here, um, commercially, the, the manufacturers of these devices want you to buy a new one every year. Does that make it highly motivated for them to want to go ahead and patch everything that's out there? Not really. So when you talk about embedded devices, this is a fairly replaceable version of an embedded device. Yes, there are some update capabilities, some better than others, but let's say there's an architectural flaw in the chip. They're not going to recall your phone that they really want you to buy a new one next year. They're not going to recall your phone. And so anybody who's left with the older version of the phone is going to be vulnerable forever. So there is a frustration, there is a balance, and there is an educational component when it comes to having um, 
especially hardware type manufacturers who are dealing in you know their software as firmware. Um, having them understand the importance of, of the ability to do some sort of an update or a recall or something like that if something is particularly egregious. Um, I think that um, when they are building their software as part of their security development life cycle, the very end of the security development life cycle says something about have a response plan. And in that, that little square of the SDL at the end, that's actually where all of the vulnerability coordination stuff happens. That's where you, you've done, you've made your product and you've released it. What's your response plan? You're never going to fix any bugs that come in? I mean, you could have that as your response plan and not recommend it. But, you know, as organizations get more mature, there are abilities to put response plans in place that are a little more sane than that, um, that have that right balance for that the organization can absorb between staying commercially viable and servicing their products and their customers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? <laughs> They're still doing that, huh? Yeah. So, okay, so you touched on a couple of different topics there, but I want to pick on the last one, the cease and desist as a response to security researchers. When I was just answering the previous question, that is not a good response plan. That is not a good way to service your vulnerabilities, is to, I know what we'll do. We'll just threaten lawsuits every time. That's called what I, uh, what I would say being stuck in the anger phase of the five stages of vulnerability response grief. Um, so no, that's not going to work. Um, the thing about that is, so, but you were, you were saying at the very beginning about how big companies who have learned their lesson actually made changes based on customer pressure, right? And you're saying that industrial control systems are either not listening to their customer pressure or not caring or not getting any customer pressure. What is it? Yeah. All? <laughs> You got it right there. They're building systems that aren't throwaway. These are 30 year plus devices. You know, a customer came and lectured us when I still worked at Microsoft and it blew my mind. This customer was a company that invested in equipment that needed to last them 50 years. It was a $1 billion investment in a certain piece of refining equipment that ran on Windows XP and they were never going to move off of it because their, all of their revenue, 100% of their revenue, depended upon this $1 billion investment that was designed to run for 50 years. They were afraid to even install patches, let alone upgrade the base operating system. So that was a nuance that was completely lost to me until I worked for uh, the biggest software company in the world with a bunch of critical infrastructure depending upon it. Sometimes. It's the customer. The vendor might have provided the fixes, might have provided whole generations of fixes. But if the customer is too afraid of actually wiping out their business or tremendously you know, affecting their business negatively by applying the fix or by upgrading or whatever it is, the bottom line is the security of that device or the security of that system is affected in a bad way. I mean, just think way back. Slammer, that fix. The patch was out for six months before that worm took over the internet. We're still in that same boat today. So I think what you, the kernel of what, what I would really like to draw out of your comment and your question is that customer education and enabling customers to also have a strong security servicing model for themselves 
is actually a really important part of the vulnerability response ecosystem as a whole. We talk about finders and vendors. The customer is a, absolutely a hard participating party in all of this. And it was due to customer pain that the biggest software security in the company in the world stopped all its developers cold from writing another single line of code when Bill Gates wrote the trustworthy computing memo in 2002 and said, no more code writing until you all get trained in security. That was unprecedented as a move then and now. I still have never heard of anybody else doing that. Thousands of developers stop making us the next generation of money <laughs> and, and invest um, you know, in security. So I think it was customer pressure that drove that change, that cultural change. And if it's industrial control systems where the customers are either unaware or unaware of the implications or are aware but in fact, it threatens their commercial bottom line, their commercial bottom line. Then there needs to be ways for us to work together as an ecosystem to help them out of that mess and, and have them be a part of the security servicing solution. Do I have time for one more? No. Nope. Um, I will be around. Uh, I will be around all through until um, I'm leaving Monday. So I'll be around DEF CON if you guys are going to be there. I'm certainly over at Black Hat. Um, if not, if you have any questions, I'm uh, K8EM0 on Twitter, Katie Mo, not Kate Emo, and, um, and I'm also Katie at HackerOne.com. Thanks very much.